We'll read verse 35 of Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says, Women received their dead, uh, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. In this passage, it showed about different people who went through torture and persecution for the name of God back then. And I like what the Bible says when they were stoned, sun asunder, tempted, slain with the sword, and they were wandering around with practically no clothes to wear, and they were tormented. The Bible says that these people, verse 38, the world was not worthy. That's right. You know, the world perceived them as weird, strange, crazy, idiotic. And God says, that's right, because they're not worthy of you. They're worthy of me. That's how I perceive and that's how I see them. Amen. And I wonder if the people in this church and we believers can say the same things about what our forefathers have went through. You know, in the eyes of the world at verse 39, we might have a bad report in their eyes. They might see us as the crazy people, the people who cause harm to the public, the people who are disdain to society. But God says they have a good report at verse 39. Why? Through faith. Through faith. And you know, right now we don't receive the promise. We don't see the happiness, the joy, the blessings that we would like to see. But God says it's not yet. Because verse 40, God says he provided some better thing for us. And then it is through suffering that we can give glory to the name of Jesus Christ. And I wonder, are you that way? You know, we cry, we whine about the restrictions and then all the persecutions, the shutdowns of churches and everything that people are going through. But, you know, are you really suffering for the name of Jesus? Are you really taking a stand for Him? Are you really serving Him? Are you reading your Bible, praying, meeting as fellow believers and then serving God to the best way of your ability in spite of persecution? A classic book that I want to give a lot of quotations of. And the title of my message today is Fox's Book of Martyrs. Let's pray. Father God, fill within me your Holy Spirit power. People took the chance to come to church today. And I pray that you will meet with them and make their drive worth it and hear something from heaven. May you speak to these people. May you speak to me. And Heavenly Father, help us to count it a privilege to suffer for thy name's sake, Heavenly Father. And that's the reason why I would stay right here. To count it a suffering for your name, Heavenly Father. And by God's grace, I will, deal, I will do it till you call me home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. My first point is violence out of tribulation. Violence out of tribulation. As Christians, we are called to go and endure through great persecution and tribulation for the name of Jesus Christ. Now, tribulation, I'm not talking about the end time, Antichrist, 666 Mark tribulation. That's all the way at the end. I'm talking about current modern day tribulation and problems and persecutions that we go through. I want you to look to I want you to turn to Luke chapter 21 please. Luke chapter 21. And we'll read verse 12, Luke chapter 21. And we'll be reading verse 12. Verse 12. Luke chapter 21 and verse 12. The Bible says, "But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons." being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. The Bible continues reading, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth in wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. 
And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. You'll notice right here Jesus said that you will be persecuted for the people. And he says don't think of it as a surprise. So when things like this happen, this should not surprise us. Amen. This should not discourage us. This is something that should be normal in the Christian walk. And the Bible says that when you're brought before the eyes of the world and suffer persecution, it says, verse 13, it shall turn to you for a testimony. It's going to be a testimony. You're going to be the record that people will know about. And God will show to the eyes of the world. The world's not worthy of you. They'll mock you. They'll make fun of you for now. But up in heaven at the judgment when God shows them your record and your story of how you suffered in the eyes of the world, to them it will be a testimony against them and God will say, see what you did against my child. Yeah. See what you thought of them. They're not so little that you thought. And the Bible says, verse 16, it's going to be common that we're going to be betrayed by our own people that we think that we can trust. And they will betray us. And some of them, our own kinsfolk, will put us to death. And we're going to be hated of all men. If you are not hated in society, then you are not a right church. Can I repeat that again? If you are not hated within society, then you are not a right church. If you're a church that seeks after the love of society and seeks to be credentialed and legitimate within society, then you are not a right church. Now, this is not to say that you're a church that's deliberately seeking a bad testimony and causing problems. No, then you're just a plain jerk, okay? You're just a plain jerk. You've got to be a good testimony in the eyes of the world. We're not supposed to be the type of people within society that's supposed to be rebel rousers or deliberately causing problems and chaos. It's amazing people who proclaim peace are the ones doing protest and causing chaos within society. And then the, the structure that we live in that's supposed to save our economy is destroying our very own economy. Yeah. See, so we're not supposed to be that type of people who preach about love and share and peace when in the end we're hypocritical and betraying society and causing hurt and harm. So you know we're not supposed to be that type of people. But what we're the, supposed to be the type of people that's supposed to preach truth. Yeah. And when you preach truth, you aren't going to be a bad testimony and you aren't going to be the jerks within society. You're going to be, as Jesus talk, talking about, innocent as sheep among, among the midst of wolves. You will be innocent. However your sheep amongst the midst of wolves. Yeah. So see, you're supposed to have a wolf that will hate you. Yeah. You're supposed to have a wolf that would persecute you. And if you're not that type of church, then you're not the right church. And that's the kind of church, I wonder if you're that type of church, you're that type of Christian. Are you hated? Do you go through violence? And that's my first point. Do you go through violence? Do you go through persecution? When we compare our own sufferings and our own hardships, especially within this pandemic situation, it very much pales in comparison to what the people have suffered back then. I mean, the, these people would put us, you and I, and man, I'm including myself right here. I would be the, probably the first chicken. I mean, God forbid that I'd be the first chicken, but I'd be the first chicken if I was there being tortured for the name of Jesus Christ, what we're going through, being tormented by our persecutors today, very much pales in comparison yeah. to the torments that our forefathers have went behind us. I mean, uh, they're forcing down on you. They're putting restrictions, putting lockdowns, telling you to do things, and you don't like being tied down to what they're doing. I mean, imagine being literally tied down like our forefathers did. Yeah. They were literally tied down to racks and they were literally, uh, you're, you're whining about these small little ropes you put around your face. They put deliberately these small ropes around their wrists that would cut to the bone. Yeah. And what they would do is, it's called the rack and they would pull them on that rack. And that poor believer in Christ, where he would not deny the name of Jesus Christ, he would have these small ropes tied to his wrist. And then when they stretched his body across the rack, that small rope would cut to the very bone and the blood would squirt out in eight di different directions while the body is hung midair. They would also put the, these believers through the pulley. And in this pulley, the ropes would be tied with their hands behind their back. 
They would be hoisted up to the air. And while they're hoisted up to the air, they would literally tie 100 pounds of iron on their feet. And while they're dangling in the air like this with 100 pounds of iron, they would loose the rope. And while they loose the rope, the body will fall and they would hold the rope while he's dropping midair. And then when they grab the rope again, it would cause a jerk reaction of nerve and joints while he stopped midair with that heavy weight on his feet. And it would cause dislocation, internal bleeding. And then they would set the joints back again to normal and then set up for another round in the pulley and let him go and dislocate the joints. And then locate the joints again, pull him up in the air, drop him, dislocate the joints again, and locate the joints again. They would put these uh, martyrs through uh, the Iron Maiden. The Iron Maiden was basically a coffin filled with spikes. And the spikes, they were, uh, they were directed in a way where it would not cause immediate death. And the spikes would even pierce their eyes at times. And then with these spikes within the coffin, they would throw in one of your... We're talking about one of your fellow believers. Yeah. Your brother and sister right. in Christ back then. And they would thrust that brother and sister in Christ in the Iron Maiden, that coffin filled with spikes. And when they close that coffin, that spikes, that would be the first thing that they would witness as the coffin would close. Deny Jesus Christ and they would not deny Him. But we get believers denying Jesus all the time. We get believers denying Jesus Christ where they would not witness to a soul, where they would bail out in church, where they would not stand for the name of Jesus Christ, where they would not pass out a tract, where they would not preach the gospel, where they won't tell a soul how to get saved. We live in that kind of a day and age today. But uh, Christians deny Jesus Christ daily. They would force some of these believers onto the water table. And in this water table, they would have a rough cloth they, they would force it down slowly upon the person's mouth with water and that way the rag can reach all the way down to the intestines. So they have to force this rough rag down and they would just uh, put water at the same time so this rag can come down. Once it reached down to the intestines, then what they would do is they would suffocate him with slow drowning of the water and then the intestines would be torn apart when they thrust out that rag. And sometimes they would even put boiling water just to put the fear into them, the fear of man even more. The heretic fork was what they would put a large fork right underneath the believers and they would tie this large fork tightly across underneath their chin like this and it would force their speech and their movement to be impossible. Otherwise their mouth would be thrust through, thrust through by the fork they would also have a victim squeezed back and forth with rollers filled with knives. And they would burn their victims at the stake as well. And burning at the stake was not fun. Literally, you would be burned alive for hours. Burning alive for hours. Why do you think the Lord, He would have lost people burned in hell for eternity? Why would He have that as a punishment? Because burning is not a fun thing. It's one of the scariest things in life. If you were fortunate then you are choked to death by the smoke when you are burnt alive at the stake. But uh, what happened is if, if you were even more lucky than the people who were choked to death by the smoke, you would be the guy who would deny Jesus while being burnt alive. And what they would do is that they would let you die burned to death, but out of mercy, they would tie a gunpowder bag around your neck and then let the gunpowder blow off your head while you're being burnt alive. And that's to the people who deny Jesus Christ. Torture back then was unbearable. And we're talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ back then. These can be recorded and these can be found by the people who undergo persecution and torture back in the dark ages. And a lot of these can be recorded in Fox's Book of Martyrs. People, they, uh, they were tied to the stocks and their feet, as they were uh, chained to the stocks, locked to the stocks, they would first be blistered. And then if they failed, and if they won't deny Jesus, then they would brand their feet. And if they still won't deny Jesus, then they would burn their feet. And if they still won't deny Jesus, then they would tear their toenail out one nail at a time. 
until they deny Jesus. When they refused to deny Jesus and they would cut off pieces from the toes to the heels to the pieces of their feet. And not only that, this was a favorite torture device for little children. We have children standing up for Jesus Christ back wow. then. Children who had put a lot of us grown adults to shame. Yeah. Some of these children would put me to shame. This, these are just a small amount of the tortures you would hear. The tortures you would hear is unthinkable what your brothers and sisters in Christ went through in communist countries, in Buddhist Hindu persecutions, in Muslim persecutions, and yes, even Catholic inquisitions back then during the Dark Ages. Victims were thrown off of cliffs onto spikes to die slowly. Women's breasts were pierced by hooks and then torn apart. Babies were ripped out of pregnant mothers to feed, to be fed to the pigs. Victims' eyes were gouged. Victims' feet were crushed by Spanish boots. Victims' heads exploded with their mouths filled with gunpowder and fire. Victims' private parts were severed and placed on top of poles for public display. Victims' teeth, eyes, and bones were plucked out from head crushers. Victims' bodies were burned and broken by the wheel. Victims were rolled back and forth with rollers filled with spikes. Victims were burned alive with boiling pitch as splendid lantern lights for people who were eating outside for dinner. Victims were tied with animal skins to be torn apart by dogs. Victims were locked up in bags of scorpions and tossed into the rivers. Victims were chained close to the prison floors and walls to be infested with rats and insects. Victims' ears and mouths were filled with hot lead and victims choked to death into their own body parts, urine and dung. Of course we must realize that all of us suffer tremendous persecution right now when we're so busy, we're so uncomfortable, we go through our own hardships and, and suffering in life. Right? That's it, really. It's a shame of today's Christianity compared to Christianity back then. These were Christians who would put you and I to shame. Little children who would put you and I to shame. Standard of our church has fallen. Could you say that uh, you would be able to take a stand for Jesus Christ and go undergo persecution like they do? Yes, I can, I will. Then why are you whining about your current persecution right now? Mm. Why are you about to throw in the towel right now? Why are you the one that's bailing out on church and Jesus Amen. Christ right now? I'd say, <laughs> don't speak so soon. Yeah. That, oh, I would go to prison for Jesus Christ and die for Him. Don't speak so soon. You know, this was unthinkable. The horror, the horror of what your brothers and sisters in Christ went through is just horrendous. In a small town in Pomerania, a group of soldiers, they were capturing women and little, uh, little girls up to 10 years of age. And while ravishing the children, they forced the women to sing hymns. Sing a hymn while I'm ravishing your child or else I'm going to burn your child alive. You think you women can take a stand like that for Jesus Christ? Not compared to back then. There was an old man, some, uh, some of you people who are elderly, there were people who are elderly who suffered for the name of Jesus. There was one old man who was stripped uh, naked and tied on his back to the table. And when they tied him on a table, they, taught, they tied a large and wild cat on top of his bare stomach. And they would prick the cat and while they pricked that cat, that cat would scream and yell and then he would claw into the old man and it tore the belly of that poor old man in shreds and that cat was chewing on his organs at the same time. There was a man named William Louth Lithgow who was accused of being a spy and religious treason and he suffered in solitary confinement. He was tortured on the rack for five hours tied to prison floors so closely that they intentionally swept vermin on his imprisoned body at the same time. His feet were tied so closely to the iron shackles that, they were, that his feet even became a part of the iron shackles that long. When the keeper broke off his shackles, it tore off a half inch of his heel. In the end, he suffered 60 different tortures during his sentence and 11 more after a sentence. 
There was a man named John Frith who was tied to a stake to be burnt alive. But the fire sticks were so few and the weather was so windy that it blew off the fire. And guess what? His hair and skin was already scorched. A second fire started and burned his lower parts and upper parts. But the sticks were so few again and the wind blew it out again. And that poor soul, he was black in the mouth, lips sunk to the gums, tongue completely swollen that he was beating his chest so much in pain, so hard that one of his arms fell off. And his other arm was gushing out fat water and blood at his fingertips. He finally died at the third fire. Can you honestly say that you undergo tremendous persecution for Jesus? That your suffering and your trial is something to whine about, to parade about? Now this is a, a whole paragraph in Fox's Book of Martyrs, page 191. And this is a torturous account of merely one pastor. All right, There are a bunch of pastors who cower, fall the knee to, uh, knee to bail today. Yeah. Look at this preacher when he was tortured. Whole paragraph just about his torture. I'm going to read it word for word. They placed him, the preacher, amidst them and made him the subject of their derision and mockery during a whole day's entertainment trying to exhaust his patience, but in vain, for he bore the whole with true Christian fortitude. They spit in his face, pulled his nose, and pinched him in most parts of his body. He was hunted like a wild beast, until ready to expire with fatigue. They made him run the gauntlet between two ranks of them, each striking him with a twig. He was beat with their fists. He was beat with ropes. They scourged him with wires. He was beat with cudgels. They tied him up by the heels with his head downwards until the blood started out of his nose, mouth, etc., they hung him by the right arm until it was dislocated and then had it set again. The same was repeated with his left arm. Burning papers dipped in oil were placed between his fingers and toes. His flesh was torn with red hot pincers. He was put to the rack. They pulled off the nails of his right hand. The same repeated with his left hand. He was bast in uh, bastinadoed on his feet. A slit was made in his right ear, the same repeated on his left ear. His nose was slit. They whipped him through the town upon a donkey. They made several incisions in his flesh. They pulled off the toenails of his right foot, the same they repeated with his left foot. He was tied up by the loins and suspended for a considerable time. The teeth of his upper jaw were pulled out, the same was repeated with his lower jaw. Boiling lead was poured upon his fingers. The same was repeated with his toes. A knotted cord was twisted about his forehead in such a manner as to force out his eyes. During the whole of these horrid cruelties, particular care was taken that his wounds should not mortify and not to injure him mortally until the last day when the forcing out of his eyes proved his death. Fox's Book of Martyrs, page 191. Now what's your prayer request and what's your unspoken after this? What's your sob story after this, Christian? This is something that uh, you should have been reading in the Bible and you know what you've been programmed? You've been programmed by an American happy yeah. consumerism culture. Amen. And that's your problem. Yeah. And we all want to pretend that this virus is not here and pretend that we're in a bliss and happy society and let's all get along. And you know, this is the Christian life is to love and share in peace and that God's blessings will richly prosper you and etc. You know, it is true God will bless you and there is joy in the Christian walk. But my goodness, keep your eyes focused on that one and your mind is distorted from reality when there is suffering and pain and hardship and let alone you're willing to undergo a little bit for Jesus Christ. What will our brothers and sisters in Christ think of San Jose Bible Baptist Church when we go to the judgment seat of Christ with them? What will we perceive when, uh, when, imagine at the judgment seat of Christ, can you be that person in line at the judgment seat of Christ talking about the, to this person, 
yeah, man, it was tough. And uh, I was serving the Lord. And, uh, man, the Lord didn't really seem that good to me. And it was difficult. Church was hard. And we were suffering. We were in the Bay Area. We were taking a stand for Jesus. And that person said, I was that guy that Pastor Kim was reading on page 191 of Fox's Book of Martyrs. What are you going to do after that, the judgment seat of Christ? You might shut your mouth after that. Be the one whining right now. I can imagine thousands in heaven right now say, you don't know what I went through. What we're going through as a church is something that we should take except and accept it as normal and count it as something that, hey, at least I can undergo something a little bit for the name of Jesus Christ. My second point is vessels out of tribulation. Vessels out of tribulation. Now, I'm not going to turn there for time's sake, but 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 through 21, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, uh, we're not going to turn over there for time's sake. Those two passages point out that there's a vessel that is burned and goes through suffering for the name of Jesus, and each vessel is different. And each vessel comes out as pure gold for the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to say that it doesn't matter if you're child, woman, man, adult, elderly, and etc. Every vessel has undergone persecution and suffering for the name of Jesus and you're not the only one. And then before you come up with your own suffering and sob story and my here's my unspoken prayer request, you should look at tons if not thousands of millions, if not millions of believers back then who have gone through the same thing and the same age as you and undergone worse persecution. Let's talk about, there were women who undergone persecution. Can you women, can you women go through persecution for the name of Jesus Christ? Can you be a pure vessel, fine vessel for His glory? Can you stand up to a woman named Mrs. Prest who was brought before the Catholic Council and who was publicly ridiculed for her short stature and ugly, thick appearance. But you know, this short, so-called ugly woman refuted their Catholic doctrines and they, the Catholic scholars that time, the Dark Ages that time, was very dark and horrible that time. And those scholars and those theologians were stumped by a woman who was short-statured and considered ugly to them and considered to be poor and illiterate. And she stumped all their doctrines. She knew more scripture than they did, those scholars. You know, they accused her, you know, you're just poor, you're illiterate. It's like today's society, right? You're not like our today's scientists. You're not like our today's standard of doctors and scholars and our theologians. You don't know Greek and Hebrew like I do. And you don't know much like I do. And you should go by the way that we do things. And you're poor, you're illiterate, you're uneducated. Who do you think you are? King James only crowd, independent Baptist churches out there, they all consider poor, illiterate people. You might be ashamed, huh? You'd be the one to throw in the towel, huh? You might be the one who bow his head in shame and say, yeah, I'll study Greek and Hebrew. You're the one that bows the knee to Baal, says whatever the school system, the government system says. Or are you, are, or are you that woman who replied back, true, though I am not learned, I am content to be a witness of Christ's death. And I pray you make no longer delay with me. For my heart is fixed, and I will never say otherwise, nor turn to your superstitious doing. Well, I mean, do we have women standing up for Jesus Christ like that? Like, you're just a bunch of pagans. You're just superstition. That's fake news over there. I don't believe a word what you're saying. You know, she was offered money and some women today might uh, recant and deny Jesus Christ for money, but she rejected it. You know why? She replied, because I am going to a city where, but, where money bears no mastery. And while I am here, God has promised to feed me. Wow, well, she had a lot more faith than today's people like, oh, during the lockdown and everything, what am I going to do with food? Yeah. You know, she was assaulted and constantly burdened by her own husband and children. Can you women have that kind of a faith for Jesus Christ? By her own husband and children. Why? Because the Dark Ages church, they forced her own husband and her own children to recant Jesus Christ. And what's the hardest thing to any woman, especially to a mother, is her own children and family. Yeah. 
But you know what? When she was sentenced to death, she praised the Lord and said, God forbid that I should lose that life eternal for this carnal and short life. I will never turn from my heavenly husband to my earthly husband, from the fellowship of angels to mortal children. And if my husband and children be faithful, then am I theirs. But if not, God is my father, God is my mother, God is my sister, my brother, my kinsman, God is my friend most faithful. You know, Mrs. Press, she was ugly. And you know, she was short. And she was poor and illiterate. And she was definitely not the standard of a woman or a mother or in Woman's Times magazine that she would win an award. You know why? The world was not worthy of her. The Lord thought something worthy of her. You know, there were children who went through better persecution than you and I did. You know, there were 8 to 10 year olds who were preaching out on the streets while the Dark Ages, the church that time, they rounded up those children and burnt them alive. And you got today's Christians who are scared to tell a person how to get saved in Jesus Christ. What in the world? You got today's churches cowering on street preaching and witnessing to people. I'm not telling you to be stupid, deliberately spit at people, you know, and, and to scare them of the virus. I didn't tell you to do that. But I'm telling you what, that last year with those people who were so bold to go out in public with their preaching, the lost world, why can't Christians do the same thing for Jesus Christ? I mean, you, you cower to Baal. The 8 to 10 year olds lining up, imagine that judgment seat of Christ, you see a whole line of 8 to 10 year olds. What if God puts you in line with them? How's your soul winning? How's your street preaching? There was a man named John Fetty who was tortured for days and days. And then he had a little boy named William who wanted to visit his father in prison. And then while he tried to visit his father in prison, the priest over there found out and he got mad at him. And the priest told that little boy, William, why thy father is a heretic. You know what that little eight-year-old replied? Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. No. That's what today's Christians would do, though. You know what this uh, little eight-year-old said to that priest? My father is no heretic. You have Balaam's mark. You bu uh, bunch of Christians. You know, you, you, you cower. You say, you know, I don't, I don't mean to say this stuff about your religion, but, you know, this little eight-year-old will put you to shame. Call it out as it is. You know what? We live in a day and age of political incorrectness and technology filtering out everything nowadays and scaring people that we don't have people crying out loud for the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not telling you to be stupid, get deliberately arrested. I'm... I've survived wonders online for some weird reason because I have to use wisdom, but you got to be bold and you got to tell it out as it is. Otherwise, God's going to, uh, otherwise, what's your excuse at the judgment? I can't say it, Lord. I couldn't say it that way because I'd offend somebody and I hurt my family member. I look like a loser in society, and God's going to say, Hey, eight year old, come over here. Remember what you said? Teach that person what you told that priest. Amen. How about couples here? There are couples who undergo, uh, who went persecution for the name of Jesus and they had no shame. There was a man named Timothy who was commanded to show where he hid the scriptures. Why? They wanted to get rid of the Bible, get rid of the scriptures. And you know what he replied? I don't know of any man who can say this. This will be tough for me to say. I don't think I could ever say this. Why? Because I'm too much of a coward. Timothy replied back, Where's your scriptures? And then he replied, Had I children, I would sooner deliver them up to be sacrificed than part with the word of God. My goodness. What is this unexplainable, crazy, fanatical love that people had over a dead Jew, a carpenter's son, three, yeah. three and a half years old, and a book that supposedly have errors? Come on. Yeah. Unless this is something else Amen. that you're holding. Amen. Unless that dead Jew was somebody else. That's somebody else. That's someone right there. That's someone. That's some book you're holding. And you part with the Scriptures daily. 
When's the last time you even looked at it? And you read it and you cherished that book. Remember this, it costed, it didn't cost you money to have this book. It didn't cost you freedom to have this book. It costed you blood. It costed you blood. Blood of people that you didn't give credit to. Yeah. You didn't say thank you Lord. When's the last time you even did that anyway? All you did was thank your food all the time. We're, we're, that's what we are. We're just carnal people. We think food is more important than the Word of God. That's how carnal we are. That's sad. It's sad. The governor was obviously enraged by Timothy's response and he tortured him to death. While being tortured, his wife Mara gently urged him to recant. I mean, do it for my sake, husband, and do it for your children. And man, can you imagine that? I can't picture a crying woman, the woman that you love, that you marry, telling you to recant. How can you go through that? You know what he did? He actually told her, point blank, you don't truly love me after all. You know what she got? She got under conviction. Because she knew that if I truly loved my husband, I would love Jesus Christ as much as he would. You know what she did? She got under conviction and you know what she said? I'm going to die with my husband. And you know what the governor did? Took, uh, took, the governor took that wife and crucified the couple together side by side. They displayed their love not only for each other side by side, but for the Lord Jesus Christ. How many couples do we have today who can dedicate together for the Lord Jesus Christ? We live in a day and age where couples are divisive, not stirred up, or only one person serving God, or both of them aren't. We need to be in it together Amen. to serve the Lord. Do we have these kind of couples? What about the young adults? Today we live in a day and age of young adults who always think about the future. My life, my marriage life, my job, and how to buy an apartment in the Bay Area. I mean, oh to joy, man. This is your reward here on earth that you're looking at. I don't know what your, what your future is. It's pretty bleak down here if that's all you're looking at. Aren't you saying your eyes up there? You young adults? There was a guy named William Gardner who was raised and educated under a merchant. He was becoming a successful businessman. He was going to have a maid, have a family, have everything. But you know, he was grieved to see his own countrymen adhering to the Catholic Mass. And he gave up his worldly life. And why? Because he gave up his worldly life, his job and position, because he was going to, you know what? Because I have a burden for my people over there who think that Jesus is a cookie when he's not. My Jesus is not a dead on a cookie. My Jesus is in heaven right now, yeah. sitting on the right hand of the Father, and He's alive. And He got so angry that these people practically would worship and kiss this cookie. It was very bad back then during the dark, dark ages. And out of anger, William Gardner, he grabbed that wafer in the middle of their service and stomped it in front of everybody. Now you would go, whoa, my goodness, hey man, I'm, I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about 1500s. 1400s back then. 1400s back then. The king, you know, when he saw that, he tried to convince him that, you know, you were just influenced to do it. You're young, you're brash, I admire your boldness and courage, but, you know, just tell them you were convinced to do it. But William Gardner, he said, no, I, I insist this was my own conscience. Conscience. This was my own right choice. He took a stand for Jesus. He didn't cower. He said, no, I was sane in my mind and I did it. So he was obviously tortured. And while he was in the pulleys, he was being burnt alive at the same time. You know what the Lord did? The Lord had one of the fires sweep across him and burn down one of the king's Catholic ships and burned it down to the ground along wow. with the boy. How many young adults do we have taking a stand for Jesus Christ and saying, look, uh, I have a burden not for my own life, but a burden for my own people yeah. who are blinded by sin, by false religion, by uh, wickedness in our world. I want them to get saved. I want them to see the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen. How many young adults do we have who have a burden and have care for the lost people and want to take a stand for Jesus Christ? There was a man named Sir Gaspar Kaplitz, and he was 80 years old. He was 80 years old. 
And even this old man went through torture and suffering for Jesus. When he was about to die, you know, he was so excited. <laughs> you might say, well, why, wouldn't he want to live longer? I mean, in a day and age, we're living at a day and age where elderly people and senior people, they want to be protected of their life, aren't they? Yeah. They treasure their life. But, you know, this man could care less. He wanted to lay it down for Jesus Christ. You know what he complained? He complained, God, why didn't you martyr me soon enough until now? <laughs> How about that? This was a man who did not uh, prize or treasure life and live a little bit longer. No, he said, no, I want to lay down my life earlier for the Lord. Now, obviously, there was an officer who was concerned for that old man, and he begged him, you know, just ask for forgiveness, ask for pardon, ask for pardon. And you know what that old man replied? Ask pardon? I will ask pardon of God, whom I have frequently offended, but not of the emperor. No, no, as I die innocent and with a clear conscience, he pointed his finger at those people, those martyrs. I would not be separated from this noble company of martyrs. But, you know, we live in a day and age where elderly people, they're like, uh, you know what, I don't want to join those other people who are suffering for Jesus. You know, I'm too old. I'm not young as I used to be. I'm not as zealous as they are, fresh energy and etc. Not this old man. He said, I don't want to be separated from this noble company of martyrs. Do we have elderly people who are able to take a stand for Jesus or they're content to just do nothing for the Lord? And to sit and do nothing during this crazy times that we're living in? You're going to do nothing for the Lord? I'm not telling you to do something stupid and then deteriorate your health. You, you don't have to do the same thing like us young people do, but you've got to do at least some level to what Christians are doing. Can't you, if you're, if you're stuck and bedridden all day long, can't you just pray for the brothers and sisters in Christ yeah. in this church? You'll be the biggest prayer warrior than all of us. You've got plenty of time to talk to the Lord and pray. Can't you just talk to the person who's caring for your health and see if that person will listen to you about salvation if they won't listen to us street preaching at that person? See if it's a frail, elder, elderly, sick person who says, you know, one day I'm going to die, but I want to see you in heaven with me. What about ministry workers, you know? That includes yours truly. We have ministry workers who cower, who compromise, who bow the knee to Baal. But not this person. His name was John Philpot. He was forced to sign a recantation. And sadly, he was signing it. But, you know, he got under conviction. And then, you know, the, the scholars and then the government society, they were excited. And then he said, no, give me back that paper. And they gave him back the paper and he tore that recantation paper in front of their eyes. So they got mad and they imprisoned him and they put him through 14 trials. But Philpot, he kept stumping his persecutors. In fact, one of the persecutors impulsively said, and uh, this guy, you can imagine, he's those, one of those religious theologians, right? One impulsively said about Philpot, Instead of the spirit of the gospel which you boast to possess, I think it is the spirit of liquor which your fellow martyrs have had who were drunk before their death and went, I believe, drunken to it. You know what Phil Potts report, retorted back? It appeareth by your communication that you are better acquainted with that spirit of liquor than the spirit of God. Wherefore, I tell thee, thou painted wall and hypocrite, that God shall rain fire and brimstone upon such blasphemers as thou art. This doesn't sound like your typical preacher who smiles at you. I mean, you, you came to the wrong Sunday service, right? You thought that a pastor would smile at you and say Jesus loves you and you hear so many good things, right? You know what? We've been distorted by society on their program of what Christianity religion should be. They don't show you the other side of Christians who died out of love for Jesus Christ and who were bold to take a stand for His name's sake. And they won't take garbage. They won't stand for garbage. And people who attack and thrust against their faith. No, they're not going to take it like whining, wimpy Christians. 
They're going to take a bold stand. Amen. You know, when he was approaching the stake to be burnt alive, two soldiers, they offered to carry him to the stake. Why? Because the ground was muddy. You know what the preacher replied back? Would you make me a pope? I am content to finish my journey on foot. <laughs> he was like, I'm not your majesty the pope. Let me walk on my own two feet. <laughs> Arriving at the stake, you know what he said? Quote, Shall I disdain to suffer at the stake when my Redeemer did not refuse to suffer yeah. the most vile death upon the cross for me? And yeah, while he died, he quoted more scripture than you did. He was quoting scripture before he died. Some of you hardly have a scripture memorized, right? These people truly love their scripture. They love Jesus more than you and I did put together. My third point is victory out of tribulation. Victory out of tribulation. And uh, we won't turn there for time's sake, but 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, points out that uh, Paul said he fought a good fight. He got victory out of his trial. His persecution he went through, and he's proud to proclaim it for the name of Jesus Christ. People today, you know, they're, they're very proud to boast about their success, their degrees, their house, their money income, the children, or everything in their home, children's education, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know what they want to do? They want to show off their rewards and their earthly goods. But sh shame on us Christians. While we're boasting about our earthly accolades, there are these mar martyrs who are boasting of their marks. Look at how many marks I have for Jesus. And that's the crying shame. If there's something we should boast about and something we should be proud of, proud of is our suffering for Jesus Christ and not our accolades and not the, the good things that we have in life. But the bad things that we were strong enough to overcome, we overcame and went through for His name's sake. It's going to be a sad thing when San Jose Bible Baptist Church, they boast more about their earthly numbers and prosperity. That's good more than the marks and persecution for Jesus. You know what I want to hear from this church is like, yeah, we went through suffering. We went through hurt. We went up through, uh, we, had, uh, we had Brother Max breaking down his car and he, he collapsed and Brother Tom who collapsed and then, you know, pastor was about to throw up and then we had people who couldn't attend all the services and they were leaving and it was so bad and, and it was 100 degrees outside the weather but you know what, we had a great service for the Lord and people got right with the Lord and then we, uh, and then we had a great service that time. Yeah. We had, you know, we had the, all the crazy stuff going around with these heavy restrictions, mm -hmm. but we found ways to get to see souls saved, reach yeah. two thousands yeah. home with yeah. the gospel, yeah. and glorify His name together. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that will go on for ages. That's why last year was quite a memory. Yeah. Never forget what you went through for the Lord. Yeah. If you have no marks, at least you have some mark, right? What victory! This should encourage us. What victory from these people that you and I went through. Can you think about all the things that we could boast about on our victories that we've overcame together as a church? Can we co go alongside elite, at least a little bit with these martyrs and talk about our victories? I may not be the one who died at the stake, burned at the stake. I may not be the one tortured at the rack, but I was the one who was told to not serve the Lord. And they tried to shut me down and shut me up. But I went out and boasted for you, Jesus. And God's like, good enough. Here's a reward for you. Good job. There were martyrs who loved to suffer for Jesus so much that once they approached the stake to be burnt alive, they would hug and kiss the stakes. Some would even complain about wasting time to prolong their death and they would say, hey, kill me sooner. Come on, I want to go to heaven and see Jesus. Some of the wives would see their husbands burnt alive, that they would shout out, if he's going to go, so must I. Let me burn alongside with him. Some of the martyrs, they would gather together in a circle and sing hymns together while the lions would come out of their uh, 
come out of their dwelling places and circle around them and they would hear the growling, the roaring, and bones being torn apart in half. And all these people just in a circle singing hymns for the Lord. The martyrs, when they write letters to convict fellow Christians, some of them would take their own blood and use it as ink as they write their letters to encourage them about suffering for the Lord and how they undergo persecution. Some martyrs, they would rejoice when they were crucified, gushed with a crown of thorns, and spears thrust in their sides. Why? Because, hey, you just made me imitate the death of Jesus Christ. And they, the persecutors thought that they would do that to make fun of them, but the Christians took that as an honor instead. So many Christians and were dying so happily and joyfully that priests and religious theologians in the Dark Ages and the Romans that time, they were so baffled and they could not find an explanation to all of this. So what they had to resort to was say, well, Satan took their souls before they actually died in the fire, making their senses of feeling past them. That don't even make sense. <laughs> you know what one of the greatest evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is? If these people were lying that, if these people were truly lying that, hey, I did not see Jesus raised from the dead, I was lying then why would they go through torture and persecution? Yeah. That would right. baffle their persecutors. And then the persecutors would go, you know, he believes what he's saying. And there were Roman centurions who would get converted and saved. As a matter of fact, two citizens of Brescia, their names were Faustines and Jovita, they suffered great torments for their faith, and the entire bloodthirsty Roman populace in the auditorium were shouting out for their blood that one pagan named Calosarius, a pagan was struck by the death of these two Christians, that he suddenly got up in the middle of the auditorium and shouted out, Great is the God of the Christians. So they got mad at him and they killed him too, obviously. This is unthinkable. Polycarp was demanded that to deny Christ. Swear and I will release thee. Reproach Christ. Polycarp, he answered back, Eighty and six years have I served him. That's an old man. Eighty and six years have I served him. And he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? And when they burnt him alive at the stake, guess what? The fire couldn't kill him. So, uh, so then what they had to do was they got so mad that they lighted us. Uh, they took out a spear and thrust him with the spear to kill him. But what the spear did was that blood gushed out and doused out the fire. So they had to light a second fire on top of that to finish the job. Now that's an 86-year-old man if not older. What victory? John Kutnar, when he came to the place of execution, an educated Jesuit once told him, embrace the Roman Catholic faith, which alone can save and arm you against the terrors of death. Kutnar, he replied back, your superstitious faith I abhor. It leads to perdition, and I wish for no other arms against the terrors of death than a good conscience. And that educated Jesuit sarcastically replied to the public, these Protestants are impenetrable rocks. Kutnar replied, you are mistaken. Christ is the rock that we are firmly fixed upon. Amen. You, have you heard the story of these Waldensians who memorize scriptures? They would assign people as homework assignments to memorize chapters, if not books of the Bible. Why? Because they did not have a complete Bible in their hand that time. And these Waldensians would memorize scriptures and verses, and they were the walking Bible. One time when one of the inquisitors was burning up these Waldensians, the Waldensians memorized so much scripture, and they were spreading scriptures rampantly through their memory, that, they, that the Waldensian cried out as he was being burnt alive, you better get more firewood to burn than us Waldensians to burn because the Word of God is going to grow bigger than this. These Waldensians would put you to shame. These were people back from the early first, uh, during the 1000s and then before the 1500s. They were people who would travel from place to place 
carrying gospel. And if they were to sleep at a place, at an inn at that time, what they would do is, they instead of tracks that time, because they didn't have those fancy chick tracks that you have today, for free, by the way, these people would write the track themselves while at the inn. And what's their track? Scripture verses they memorize. Just write down scripture verses and leave that for the person to get saved by. Amen. These were all dungeons who memorized scripture. And in fact, one of the inquisitors, the inquisitors who tortured them could not even deny it. He wrote down about these wall dungeons. These people truly memorized so much scripture. The inquisitor even said, I even heard one of them quoting the entire book of Psalms. Or an entire chapter of Psalms, if that's too long. Victory. Victory. Christopher Chober, when he died, he said, I come in the name of God to die for His glory. I have fought the good fight and finished my course. So, he turned to the executioner. Executioner, do your office. Cut off my head. Roland Taylor, when he was going to burn alive at the stake, you know what he replied? Oh, it's too much. Oh, suffering's too difficult, Lord. No, he replied, Thank be God, I am even at home. Reverend Saunders, he prayed flat face on the ground. And then he all of a sudden jumped and embraced and hugged this burning stake. And he cried out as he hugged that stake, Welcome thou cross of Christ. Welcome everlasting life. Lawrence, before he died, he cried out to his fellow martyrs, these are the precious treasure of the church. These are the treasure indeed in whom the faith of Christ reigneth, in whom Jesus Christ hath his mansion place. What more precious jewels can Christ have than those in whom he hath promised to dwell? Let's all go to our mansion in heaven. Heaven, what a privilege. It's a great privilege to die and suffer with you. All right, I'll see you in your mansion in heaven. Oh, pastor, undergoing persecution and suffering. I'll see you in the mansion in heaven, brother and sister. The Lord's going to... It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Right before he was burnt alive, one martyr said to his fellow martyr, we shall this day, by God's grace, as they were going to be burnt alive, light up such a candle in England as I trust will never be put out. There was a woman named Joyce Louise who said this when she died. When I know that I shall behold the amiable countenance of Christ my dear Savior, the ugly face of death does not much trouble me. Amen. Simeon Susicki, right before he died, he was so impatient to die that he said, every moment delays me from entering into the kingdom of Christ. One classic example that I would fail to tell you is Ignatius, who was torn apart by lions in the Colosseum. And, uh, you know, when uh, his fellow Christians offered to rescue him, to bail him out, Ignatius said, no, leave me alone. I want to die for Jesus. Don't try to rescue me. Don't you dare rescue me, he said. And when those lions came out, as he was in the middle of the Colosseum, he said this, now I begin to be a disciple. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things so that I may win but Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ Jesus. And as those lions approach even closer at him, he egged them on and he invited with his arms outstretched and some paintings of Ignatius being eaten by lions. You'll notice his arms being outstretched like this as if he wants to hug the lion who's about to leap at him. And he was inviting them to eat him up. He cried out to the lion, I am the wheat of Christ. I am the wheat of Christ. I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts that I may be found pure bread. Amen. And the lion sunk his teeth at Ignatius and he just cried out, I am the wheat of Christ. And as his blood gushed out and he fell down to the ground, 
All he said was, I am the wheat of Christ. Now, no matter what persecution that all of hell can throw at you, one thing I've learned is this, is that there is always victory in Jesus. And you will get victory, no matter how impossible or how bad the odds are. The only problem is, is that you're not, under, you're not willing to put your trust in God. And you're not willing to put faith in Him. And you're not willing to first surrender for His namesake. And say, Lord, Thy will be done. And when you do that, your life is in for a ride. And He will never fail, fail you, not even once. You know, every time that I thought about quitting, you know what I tried to do? I tried to think about one, the time that the Lord failed me. And He never failed me, not once. Why do you think I still preach and teach in a Bible-believing church? Why do you still think that I pastor here? He never failed me one time. If there's something that always went wrong in my life, it's something that I always made the mistake. And I never yielded to His saving grace. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. I don't know if the Lord spoke upon your heart, but feel free to come down here on the altar's floor. You can feel free to pray in your seats, however way the Lord laid upon your heart. I mean, we're going through trying times, but it's such a crying shame what our church has undergone compared to our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ who has undergone persecution. And by the way, there are those who are going through persecution right now. As of this very moment, while you're having church, while we're having an air-conditioned place and everything, that they are suffering and crying out for the name of Jesus Christ while you and I are just sitting and whining on our blessed assurance. You know, God's been too good to us. God's been too good to me and you. Remember this, is that there are plenty of brothers and sisters out there right now who are going through suffering. Right now, as of this very moment. Will you tag along with your brothers and sisters? You know, will I... Don't worry about so much pain and torture, torture that, oh, I don't think I can reach the limitation. God's not going to give you a burden greater than you can bear. And trust me, you'll never reach. You'll never reach that pain and torture level that our brothers and sisters have went through for the Lord. You'll, you won't even reach there. But can you at least go behind their coattails? And God might say, these are the martyr, martyrs who died for my name. These are the people who lay their lives down for my name's sake. And you might not be in that crowd, but at least you and I might be the crowd behind them, right? And say, Lord, don't forget me. I'm right here, Lord. I didn't suffer as much as they did, but I'm, I did what I could. And I'm following behind them. And the Lord's like, okay, come on, tag along. The Lord knows. He knows your trial. He knows your suffering. He knows your pain. But He's testing to see if that child of yours, if that child of His, that you would be the one who would follow along with your brothers and sisters who have went through the same. It's going to be a shame that our brothers and sisters have died to give us the Word of God, to give us the freedom to serve God in a Bible-believing church. And then we disgrace their blood. But what's worse than that is you disgrace the blood that Jesus shed for you on the cross. He went through the worst torture than all of us put together, than all the martyrs went through. That would be the most shameful thing is that we disgraced His own blood that He shed compared to our brothers and sisters, the martyrs. I want to make sure that uh, every person goes to heaven after they die. All right, Ask yourself this question and please be honest. If you were to die right now, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? Are you 100% sure? You might say, I'm not sure if I can go to heaven after I die. You know, you're missing out something right now. You got to realize this. There were people who died <laughs> who were stupid enough, let me say. They were stupid enough to be tortured, give up their family because they believed in heaven that much. They knew it was real. It was something that would wipe away all tears from their eyes. I can't tell you how much you're missing out right there. We're talking about a heaven that's forever. You might say, well, I don't know how to go to heaven. How do I go to heaven? You just simply... Tell God, tell God that God, I repent as a sinner and I believe Jesus is God who died and resurrected to save my soul. 
Jesus died to save your soul, my friend. Do you believe in that? Don't trust in how well you live. Oh, I go to church, I get baptized, I live a good life, I got to quit sinning. If you trust in those things, you're not going to get saved. Why did Jesus die for you if your good works count? See? He died for nothing then. You know why He died? He died to save you. So you need to only rely on that to save you. And you need to say that to Him. You might say, I don't know how to say it. Can you help me, Pastor? Sure. I'll give you the words on how to say it and you can repeat after me. And don't worry, it's totally private. Just say it to yourself. Just say it to yourself. Repeat after me in this way. You can say, Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I only rely on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. Not my good works. Save me from hell. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you could bow your head and close your eyes one last time, please, one last time. Thank you for your patience. I'm done now. I'm about to wrap it up. Thank you so much for your patience. I appreciate your time. I'm going to wrap it up right now so that I can get you out of here soon, okay? So, uh, if any of you, if this is your first time, if this is your first time doing it with me and repeating those words after me, could you slip up your hand real briefly, real quick, and say, Hey, Pastor, I just got saved. I repeated those words after you. And I'm not going to point out who you are. Every head is bowed and every eye is shut. It's totally private. Could you slip up your hand real briefly right now, please? Anybody? Anybody at all? Is there anybody? Just slowly raise it up. Okay, thank you so much for your honesty. I'll trust that everyone is saved and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I trust that everybody is uh, putting their faith on the shed blood of Christ and on their own works. And I pray that we have learned something special today and we have been encouraged. We have been encouraged, motivated, and convicted about what our brothers and sisters went through. And that we have repented and that we will come out as stronger vessels for you. What a crying shame Christianity has turned out, Lord. If all of us went to the judgment seat of Christ, we'd be pitiful, Lord. I pray that today would be the starting day that we're not at least that bunch. That we'd be found faithful to you. We'd be the person, we'd be the church that the world is not worthy of. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.